This presentation is for Bank of America clients only. If you're a member of the media or the press, please disconnect now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for joining us for Standard Chartered. A few minor technical issues. I'm, um, I'm only delighted we made it until quarter four in the afternoon before something's gone wrong. We do have Andy Halford, Group Finance Director, with us. You won't be able to see him. You might. You might have to look at me, for which I apologise. Um, but Andy is with us, and I, I'm going to launch straight into it with Andy. I know he's just run in from a series of other meetings. I think he even gets time for biscuits in a virtual conference versus a, versus a live one. But Andy, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, talking about Asia, so it feels like a long way away all of a sudden now. That certainly, few, you know, so few people are travelling from here to there. But um, Possibly quite a different picture to the one in the UK, which feels um, fairly tough here. And been some quite good um, economic data numbers. Um, trade looks like it's beginning to recover. Is that is that your experience that uh, Asia's coming back? Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, firstly, my apologies. I'm not quite sure why the video bit isn't working. But um, anyway, um, but, but yes, absolutely, it is the case. Um, I think those of us who sort of sit in Europe or maybe the US and are, are feeling a bit sort of down about stuff at the moment. Um, when I do calls pretty much daily with colleagues in various of our businesses, particularly the Northern Asia ones, um, China, I, I guess probably a standout, Hong Kong to a reasonable extent, and, and Korea, et cetera. Um, that they are much more, well, China is sort of saying, look, we might not be quite where we were at just before COVID started, but we're certainly very, very close to it now. Um, Hong Kong obviously is sort of stepping a little bit gingerly around the odd sort of spikes, but, you know, most people there are saying, look, the civil unrest of a year ago, that, you know, has really uh, gone away. Um, COVID, you know, people are now sort of going back into restaurants and things like that. And there is much more of a sense, I think, in many of those countries that, um, you know, there, there is this light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's, it's not going to be a totally easy route. Um, some of the Southern Asian markets have obviously got a little bit further to go. Um, but certainly the sense there is much more positive than the sense that one would get um, in the more, quote, unquote, mature parts of the world that uh, as we or those of us who live in it you know, tend to probably see on a daily basis. Um, so, simple answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Well, that's a good start. Um, and, and, and in that light, is it a growth business again yet? So, um, you, you had got back to putting the bank on um, some nice volume growth uh, before this all happened. Um, does it take a while? to find a feat and for you to work out parts of the portfolio, or should we be thinking about this as something volume-wise, we'll come on to margins later, but volume-wise, um, something that you can get back onto quite quickly? Well, I, I think it, it is going to be a story in two parts, as, as your question touches upon. Um, you know, it, it is unavoidable that the downdraft of interest rates and the impact upon margins is going to be a feature for us over the balance of the year. And, you know, we, we, we've talked to that previously. Um, and obviously, we don't see interest rates, so there's a limit uh, to what we can do. Um, I'd say if you sort of put interest rates on one side and look at the collective of re the rest of what is going on in the business, as a collective, it is actually not too dissimilar to activity levels of a year ago, excluding the interest rate impact. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it is universally that, but, um, you know, we, we've had the areas financial markets obviously been very buoyant. Um, trade is more interest rate impacted. Um, but, you know, a lot of the business mortgages, things like that, um, there will be a rate impact for those who are on variable rate, but actually the overall volume of mortgages, you know, it's a pretty long book that's been there for a period of time. It doesn't change a huge amount. Um, most corporates have got more rather than less debt on their books at the moment, and therefore there is volume on that side of it. Um, there are some who are just sort of keeping a little foot in the water to sort of have a look at whether there are acquisition opportunities out there, particularly with prices being incredibly low at this point in time. Um, so overall, I'd say we, we are absolutely not giving up on the volume opportunity. 
I think it will realistically be a little bit moderated for a period of time. Um, but our sense is it's sort of a depression for a period of time or a suppression probably for a period of time. Um, but underneath it all, at the end of the day, the world is going to be consuming roughly what it was consuming in the aggregate before. The world is still going to be making quite a lot of stuff that is not consumed at the point of production. That doesn't shift dramatically overnight. And therefore, I think what we have to do is sort of look through this particular period with the, um, the rate effects and actually make sure that particularly with uh, digital platforms and on the retail side much more um, sort of mobile access from customers, that we are there, we're at the party, and as things start to get hopefully into sort of better spaces over a period of time, we're very much there, ready, willing, and able to take our place at the table. Thank you. And then within that, of course, Hong Kong, um, typically your most profitable market, certainly um, one that's been very good to you over the years. Like you said, uh, um, the, the, the civil unrest has calmed down, uh, but the tourism hasn't come back yet. There's There's been some political concerns, but there's been a huge IPO um, boom. Where, where, where does that land, um, Hong Kong, for you? Yeah, great, great question, isn't it? I think um, for those who don't have a lot of direct dealings with Hong Kong, one tends to sort of hear mostly fairly pessimistic stuff, particularly with regard to uh, sort of US-China relations and things like that. Um, if we talk to, as I do, members of our team out there, they would say, I think, two things predominantly. One, the social unrest is in a much, much better space than it was a year ago. Um, you may question, you may have different views on the law and the changes that cause that, but it is the case. And, um, you know, the streets are very calm and, um, you know, that, that side of it has sort of just disappeared very quickly. And they'd say, secondly, that the actual visible impact of the China-US is sort of not really there. Um, it is obviously something that is a preoccupation in a lot of people's minds, a lot of banks' minds about sort of where it could go. But at this point in time, you know, sanctioned individuals is a relatively small list for any one bank, ourselves included. The subset of that list is, is very well manageable. Um, there's been the sort of TikTok WeChat stuff that sort of seems to maybe be now heading in a particular direction. Um, and I think it is much more about behind the scenes just being prepared, depending upon what next happens. But as has so often been the case in Hong Kong over multiple decades, there is a resilience. And as you say, the, the flows of money in for IPOs are still very high. Um, corporates on the one hand around the world are maybe being cautioned that dealing with it with China is sort of something they should think carefully about. But I'd have to guess that many of those same corporates are saying, well, let's just look at where the market opportunity is over the next decade globally. And you'd still put China very, very near the top of the pile, if not at the top of the pile. So the amount of activity that there is still going on between non-Chinese and Chinese businesses remains high. Um, roughly two-thirds of inward investment into China comes through Hong Kong, roughly two-thirds of investment out of China, so the rest of the world goes through Hong Kong. And that isn't disappearing any time overnight. So our, our, our sort of, you know, at the moment, things are reasonably calm. Obviously, GDP is depressed because of tourism, things like that, that is for sure. But I think it is just showing a level of resilience that maybe is a little bit belying what, what, what some might take away from the external the press and the media. Got it. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to remind the audience, you can ask questions. We're, we're clearly live. Um, so I can see the questions, Andy can't, so I can drop him on him as well if you ask me some good ones. Um, <laughs> Andy, I, I'll, I'll ask you one that there's, you know, I, I should know how this works by now, but between that capital flow you talked about in, in Hong Kong, between the, the PEG, um, the IPOs, um, it, it, interest rates, um, you know, what, where's that standing right now? So Highball was, was below LIBOR for years, and it was above LIBOR, and it came down, and it's going back up again. Um, are, are you, uh, you know, interest rates, more of a drag, less of a drag, depends on the time of day, you know, just for that, that particular piece of the business, Hong Kong? 
Yeah, it, it is extraordinary. If you look back over several years now, we've had high ball, low ball relationships which have sort of inverted, have, have narrowed, have widened. And yet, over that period of time, our margins have remained remarkably constant. Now, part of it is that there is also this prime rate of a lot of the mortgages are based upon a cap, which itself is based upon yet another rate. Um, so there's, there's really quite a combination of several moving parts in it. But I, I would just observe that actually through thick and through thin, and lots of things moving around, there hasn't been a particular movement on overall margins for our business in, in Hong Kong, indeed, for our major competitor either. Um, and with the capital inflows that are still coming into the country, particularly IPO related, with the absence of any sort of sense that there is any massive outflow because of nervousness about the future or whatever, which we're not seeing. Um, but um, it's sort of more in the slightly boring, but steady as she goes, which for a big profit center, as it is for us, is, you know, it's not a bad place to be. Thank you. And well, in, in talking about the future, so I see Mox is out there now. Um, and so you, you've launched a whole new bank this year, which is um, uh, quite some going. Um, well, what's the opportunity? Then? And, and I suppose who gets disrupted? I mean, you must be disrupting yourself a little, but presumably you're aiming at um, some of the others in the market. Where, 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 where's, that, where's that going for you? Yeah, so we, we've sort of now officially launched Box, and those who pre-registered, we are now um, sort of signing up to the real customers. Um, I think, I mean, the story on this one goes back two and a half years or so when um, the regulators there said that they were minded to make licenses available, they would be digital only, they would not be put in water. And we, we did have the discussion about sort of what we should do to your question. Uh, clearly, there is a risk of some cannibalization. But our view, um, for several reasons, was we should actually press on with it. One was that. Um, if we didn't get the license, somebody else is going to get it. So there would be some element of cannibalization anyway. Um, secondly, by actually building a new bank, and this has been done as a completely freestanding technology stack, taking sort of the best components of things that we either do ourselves or some others do, um, and building something that was freestanding, it would be a very interesting learning and potentially one that could then be sort of copied and pasted into other countries. Um, thirdly, our sense was that actually if we were thoughtful about it and we deliberately marketed it at a different audience to our historic customer base, which you know is of a certain age profile, to we say, um, that actually there is quite um, a, a, a market opportunity for us in a slightly younger age group. Um, probably to get to that younger age group, we didn't just need a technology platform, but we needed to think a bit more about brand and hence why we decided that we would actually go with a different brand name, um, Box, in, in this instance. Um, so I think that um, it's been very rich in learnings in terms of getting the stack to where it is today. It will be very rich in learnings over the coming months as we essentially put more and more customers onto it. Um, the fact it's made our teams really, really think about what is the best that is going on around the world in terms of presentation of banking services to customers, not looking at it from the context of what we historically done and how do we add to that um, is also good learnings. And the fact that it can be copied and pasted essentially into other markets if we so desired. Um, and in another market, you know, if a regulator said that they're planning on doing similar, then the hope would be that if we could get a license there, it would be our second time around experience, whereas some of those that we might be competing against, it might be first time around. So for all those reasons, I think it is actually quite an important milestone for us. Um, it is one of a number of digital things that we have been pushing on. We've done a lot in Africa with a much more sort of cut down, uh, low cost um, <laughs> alternative. We have got the Nexus platform that is first being launched in Indonesia, which will be different again. It will be a sort of interface between um, our banking systems and an e-commerce player's front-end system so that they can bolt financial services products seamlessly um, onto their website and onto their offering. Um, so I, I sort of see them as part of a pretty determined push now 
to make sure that we do really um, not just talk about technology and not just talk about digital, but really make it happen and make this business over the next you know, few years um, a business that is much more savvy in that respect. Thank you, thank you. Um, now, uh, shifting a bit, it's quite quite a big restructuring of the group, um, and it, it, you know, not lopping bits off, but changing the shape of it, both geographically and uh, and in the business lines that you announced just a couple of weeks ago. Could you, could you could you tell us what you what that what that does, what opportunity that provides, whether it's revenue focus, cost focus, capital allocation? How, how do we think about those changes? Yeah, so we, we've made two changes, as, as you say, sort of one about client groupings and one about geographic groupings. Um, let, let me talk to the geographic one first, because in some senses, I think it's simpler. So we, we have previously had the Northern Asia region and the Southern Asia region run separately with everything that we are seeing in terms of flows within Asia in the broader sense of the word. Our sense was us having a bifurcation within our own definitions and organization structures when the rest of the world didn't bifurcate it that way um, was slightly sort of unnatural. And that by actually looking at it as a region and having it under one person, which would be Ben Hung, that actually the ability to both tap into more flows across the region uh, was a very real one and possibly at a time when more people will maybe be thinking about whether they want to slightly detune their uh, dependency upon China and actually reweight then obviously the Asian region is, is one of the potential beneficiaries of that. Um, and secondly, there will be some element of cost efficiency that will come out of not having to sort of carry to lots of regional overhead. So I think that one is sort of you know, a pretty logical sort of evolution of where we have been. The client group one is, is slightly different in its nature. So we've sort of had two corporate groups and two um, consumer groups for a number of years. And the corporate groups, the CIB and the commercial bank, which is smaller, but the CIB business in particular that Simon Cooper has run for the last several years has been run um, more, well, I don't like to use the word centrally, but it's been sort of coordinated from the center whereas the retail businesses have been more run from sort of countries and the sense that actually we've probably made more progress over the last few years, particularly in terms of standardizing systems in the corporate space than we have in retail. And it's actually time that we really grabbed the retail consumer sort of broader definition um, in a more um, cohesive way and make sure that the sort of platforms we've got are ever decreasing in terms of variety, that the product offerings we've got, we are actually learning from um, countries and sort of sharing those against the sort of platforms. And so the view was that actually we should pull together what was previously the sort of retail um, and the private bank and essentially say, right, let's have one unit. Uh, Judy Sue is going to run that. She's um, very, very well backgrounded on the consumer side of it. And actually say, right, let's put our best foot forward and see whether actually over the next two or three years we can get the, re the retail consumer business into the sort of same space as we've got the CIB business. It will make the business a bit simpler to run as well. It's a broadly corporate and consumer. That is reasonably memorable. And we're sort of raising Asia and we're the rest of the world, which is also simpler. So I, I hope there are benefits on both fronts, on both income and on cost. That is certainly the intent. Um, we're going through at the moment just working out exactly how we'll structure it and who will do which roles. And uh, the intent is to have that fully in motion by the uh, start of next year. Great, um, thank you. Now, just before I dig into costs, um, uh, um, what, what, one question on the revenues, I guess, one of the hardest things for us to forecast, um, well, I've already said I can't forecast net interest margins and I can't forecast Hong Kong interest rates. So I'm running out of things like, I could done, I, I can't forecast financial markets and, and, and you know, the, 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 the trade in the capital markets side of the, of, of the CIB, which actually did really well in the first half. And, you and Bill talked a little about how you got, you know, increased confidence that what you've been doing is, is, has worked. I suppose how much of the first half carry through into the second 
half and, and into next year and, and um, how much of that was just special because the level of dislocation? Um, I think a little bit like the answer to your, your first question, um, the, there is the interest rate effect, which is with a book that sort of, I don't know, has a roughly nine month maturity, it is sort of a rolling effect through from what probably March when it sort of started through to the end of the year. Um, and that, you know, is, is reasonable size numbers and undoubtedly that is a headwind. And we've also got to remember as we go into next year that we will have had the sort of the 2020 effect will have been started high and ended a bit lower, whereas we'll start next year obviously at the lower point. Um, put that on one side, again, the sort of activity levels on the average across the rest of the business have actually held up very well. Um, now, some of that obviously is bolstered by the financial market side of things. Um, and as we said, I think a number of banks have said, you know, it was really very buoyant in the first six months. It would be, it'd be wonderful to think that it was going to be as buoyant in the, in the next six months and six months thereafter. Um, maybe it will not be quite as buoyant, but there's still so much moving around, the uncertainty that's out there, the need for treasurers to sort of still be pretty mindful of um, exposure management and hence hedging and hence that sort of product group, I think still remains reasonably compelling. We've then got the other sort of factor that this year was a year when there was sort of maybe two months or so that was sort of at pre-COVID levels, and then the rest of the year obviously went on a ramp down pretty quickly. And the relativity, I think, as we go into 2021 is going to be, um, maybe this is a little bit questionable in the, um, the Western markets, but maybe it will be more of a truism in the Asian markets that we'll have a year when actually it starts at the lower point and progressively is picking up. And, um, you know, the hope would be that one period that has sort of 10 months of downdraft, maybe we will not have quite the same um, opposite effect as we go into next year. And then the things that we've just been talking about on sort of mocks and other digital sort of um, pushes um, will hopefully be things that will be additive. So I, I do agree with you. It is, it is a difficult period to forecast. Um, I think one needs to sort of take a view on the interest rate effect and then sort of look at the rest in the round. Um, it is a period when clearly credit impairment, which we'll probably get on to, um, is a big ticket item this year. We'll hope that it's slightly less big next year. And then it's going to be the balance of um, investing in the business for the future, but keeping a very firm handle on the cost. Uh, well, you've, you've, you've teed me up nicely there for the next two questions. So I'm going to ask you cost first and then, and then, and then credit. You know, down 5% year on year in the first half, very, very strong cost performance, um, clearly a, a confidence around cost now. Um, but how, how do you keep that lid on while, while investing? I mean, because there is still inflation in new economies and there is, there is still growth. Yeah, I, I think over the last three or four years, we've made quite a change in the business sort of culturally for the cost issue. Um, I think a lot of businesses are sort of naturally resistant to having to take cost out. But when you can eventually sort of get the message across that, you know, every dollar you can take out is potentially another dollar that's available to invest for the future, that we do need to transform the business more in the future and therefore let's you know, let's really lean into this. So I think that sort of penny um, has has definitely dropped. We've been sort of around the ten billion dollar mark for the last three years or so, excluding the bank levy. Um, and in keeping it flat, we have typically had to sort of work our way through a natural rate of inflation, you know, two or three hundred million dollars a year. And we've also doubled the investment in IT, which when you come to sort of expense it, is probably another sort of three hundred million a year of incremental costs going through that we didn't have. So there, there is a track record of probably underneath it all taking five or six hundred million out each year in order to basically be able to offset the additional future investment and the inflation cost. And essentially that is what the challenge continues to be going forward. Now this year is slightly strange because part of the reason, you know, being completely empty about it, that we have got the cost down lower this year is the decision we took very early on in COVID, which was just to manage expectations within the business on variable compensation. And say to people, if we are in a very difficult period for the world and likely the results will be depressed this year, you know, don't think we're going to be paying out bonuses at the 
same level that we have done recently. And hence, you know, we have got a lower level of accrual on bonuses, and hence that is giving us some of the benefit. We've also got some benefit from travel and um, hotel costs, which obviously have also massively declined. Um, the real trick for us is if we're going to stick to 10 billion this year, having got those benefits and going to replicate 10 billion next year, then we've got to replace those what I hope are sort of more near-term um, actions, uh, i.e. we don't want to have to be reducing the bonuses forever, um, with some concrete alternatives that give us the confidence that we can take um, the equivalence of cost out in the 2021 year. Um, the rationalization of the regional structures we've just talked about will be a help in that regard. The consumer group coming together will be help in that regard. Um, we didn't make a big song and dance about this but a couple of months ago. We've sort of put the final parts of our commercial um, business together with the CIB business. Again, there's a few tens of millions of cost takeout that comes from that. Um, and then also, we've been doing a lot of work with um, David Whiting, our COO, so looking at the business much more through the eyes of the customer, looking at end-to-end -end processes from the very first experience to the end experience of the customer. How does it feel? Not the classic which functional cost are we bearing, but just what does it look like um, from that customer lens? And again, I hope that that actually will sort of shake some costs out. So we're not short of further ideas or things to do to take cost out. Um, obviously, it does get a bit tougher as, as time goes on. But um, you know, back to your question, I think we have shown um, a degree of track record, and um, everybody is, is sort of leading into it. And uh, the fact we're having a discussion now, and it's September, and we're talking essentially about the period 15 months ahead, um, I think shows that we're we're on the front foot on it. Thank you. And, and so on the credit costs, um, I mean, you know. <laughs> Where to start? I mean, there are no credit losses in Hong Kong, which is, is your biggest single market, but everywhere else, I mean, how can you even tell? So, it's, so the, 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 I, I can't predict these either. You can see where I'm going with this. Um, but uh, what's your level of confidence that that shape of this year's and uh, uh, credit losses is, is what you thought at the half year, I guess, where the first half was bigger than the second half? Yeah, it's, it, it, it is a difficult area to accurately forecast. We, we all know that. Um, I think my first observation is, thank goodness, we took the medicine we did three or four years ago and really, really tightened up on a lot of our credit criteria because we would clearly be in a very different space now if we had not done that. Um, I think, secondly, we have clearly taken you know, a billion and a half of charge through the P&L in the first half. And that is a big increase on the previous year, but relative to what's been going on around us and you know the size of the book, I don't think it is sort of out of uh, um, out of out of order. As we go forward, we've said, look, if the world sort of is broadly how we saw it when we did the first half results, then you know we we'd be sort of thinking that second half hopefully would be slightly lower than the first half. Now. It's a little bit fickle because it does depend very, very much on how quickly does the world get on top of COVID. Um, if uh, COVID does last a little bit longer, are governments prepared to actually uh, support, provide relief measures for slightly longer periods so that actually businesses that are um, fragile can get through that period? Um, if you're living in the Western part of the world, you go, oh gosh, you know, it all looks a bit more gloomy at the moment. If you're living in Asia, you sort of go, no, it's probably still on the sort of track that we expect it to be on. Fortunately, the majority of our business in, is in the latter space. I think there's also pretty clear evidence that most governments, whilst they have been very focused upon lives, they are very, very clear that they don't want the economies shot even more than they are at the moment, and that having mass insolvencies and then mass unemployment they really are trying to pull out as many stops as they can afford to do to try to prevent that situation happening. So for once, I think most of government intent and what is probably good for banks are reasonably aligned. And therefore, you know, we should have a sort of common interest in how we how we work through this. 
um, at the end of the day, our capital position is strong, probably leading into another of your questions, um, and therefore, you know, we, we can afford, if there is a bit of deterioration in either credit migration terms or further impairment charges, you know, it's not a disaster for us at all. Um, but obviously, we want to try to minimise those costs as we go through this period and leave as much, you know, in the bank. So at some stage, when we can return to distributions, um, we've got more available to distribute. Thank you. Well, so my last question, and then there's, there's there's one audience one that I know everyone's going to want answered. So my last question then is on distributions. Um, is there anything you can add? I mean, uh, close bill has paid a dividend today. I, 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 that wasn't mm. wasn't in my expectations. Um, and and um, so is there anything? I mean, I'd assume the answer is no. But so is there anything you can help us with? Because it does look like your capital's strong. You've had a stress test and and, and come out of it reasonably well. I mean. I assume you'd like to make distributions if you're allowed to. Yeah, it's it's a sort of curious world, isn't it? You, you look at all the stress tests that have been done by the Bank of England over the last few years, and you know people dip by you know five percentage points or whatever down at the, the worst point, and yet we are eight months into the world's sort of biggest crisis for many, many, many years, and not not just us, but certainly for us, you know, we're sitting with capital levels that are strong. In fact, for us, they're actually. Um, above our business as usual sort of target range. Um, now, obviously, some of that was assisted by the sale of Pomata, but um, you know that, that that is sort of just one of the things in the mix. Um, do I feel good that this far into a major crisis, we are still very well capitalised, we're still very liquid? Yes, absolutely. Um, do I hope that over the coming weeks that there will be a bit more of a pattern to the sort of uh, credit migration, the write-offs, et cetera, so that we can get a bit more confidence in how we think things are going to play out? Yes, I do. Um, we're then going to be more in the hands of the regulators and what their sort of uh, preparedness is to, um, you know, to, to look at things a little bit more flexibly. I, I can only imagine for them that that is going to be very much based upon taking a view as to how much more COVID sort of stuff is yet to happen. And um, if they think there's enough sort of cushion there that they may be more flexible about allowing distributions to return. Um, at the end of the day, Bank of England said they're going to look at it in the fourth quarter. And um, you know, I think that that's probably a sensible thing from a regulatory point of view for them to do. So it's 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 a long answer to say I don't really know the answer to your question as you expected, um, but at least we're sitting there fairly full of capital, and I'm sure one of the arguments we would run would be some of the surplus capital we've got was because of an M&A event, and in normal market situations we would return that almost certainly some time ago. So whether we can have that sort of looked at slightly separately to the core. I don't know whether that is, um, you know, a way that they'll be prepared to look at it or not, but it's certainly a case we'll put forward. Thank you. Thank you. We are, we are hard against our, our time, and I'm just going to ask this one audience question, um, and again, it might be a simple one. Um, but managements today have spoken, and, and they ha actually I've confirmed this, they have, about a more favourable view of M&A from regulators. Does this have any effect on how Standard Chartered Think. So, I mean, that's a very generic question. Obviously, we've had a Spanish deal and Italian deal, rumours yeah. of Swiss deals. So, it, it, you know, you, you might well say those things are extremely tangential to you, but I think it's a fair question. Yeah, I mean, let me answer it in two sort of different ways. Well, one not specific, and then maybe one specific. I mean, my, my personal view is that this is a well oversupplied market generally, particularly in Europe. Um, that um, in periods of very low margins with more players than are needed to actually assure end users of still having a very competitive market, you know, why would you not be more accommodating of mergers? And particularly from a regulator's point of view, if mergers actually sort of take out players who, you know, maybe not necessarily the case of the two examples so far, but could have been a headache for the regulators at some point in the future, um, why on earth would regulators not be more sympathetic to that? Um, I, I think it is good that there is now tangible sort of evidence that um, there is now uh, a, a different view being given to that. I think it's kind of chartered. It's, it's sort of possibly different. Um, the synergies that are coming through on the two that are sort of being talked about at the moment are both within country 
and obviously within country synergies to banks to institutions probably the cost take out is is much more compelling um that's obviously not so much the case with us because we're just sort of not mirrored by others um so much um we have got a footprint that is very different um, for some people, that actually might be appealing. For some people, with the whole China-US thing at the moment, it might be frightening. Um, so um, I, I think we just have to sort of go as we were doing and do what is best for the bank. Um, I think that some of the in-country stuff may happen. That's probably not a direct relevance to us. But the most important thing for us is we, you know, we accept that there's going to be a little bit of setback in terms of the roti target, which is inevitable because of COVID. We just need to get back on that track as fast as we can do and hope that in a year or two years from now, we'll be sort of saying, well, that was a pretty horrible period, but we did actually come through it. We came through it stronger and, um, you know, we're, we're well positioned to put the best foot forwards. Great. Andy, that's been our deal. We are out of time now. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see everybody else in about seven minutes with Banco Santander. Right. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Ben. Bye.